Betty Jane! Oh, Betty Jane! I can't find my yellow garter. Well, you look for it after breakfast, honey. Everything's getting cold. Junior, you might use your comb and brush. Gee, do I drink this orange juice? Mother, I don't want any crust on my toast. Say, you kids, you eat what is set before you and like it. Crust is good for the teeth, Betty Jane. Oh, gee, this orange juice has seeds in it. Henry. Hmm? What do you want for supper? How about pancakes, Mother? And I cream for dessert. Huh, Mother? Huh? I was speaking to your father. Huh? What is it? What do you want for supper? Whatever you give me will be okay. You're running the house. Yes, but I'm running it to please you, dear. What do you want to eat? Bacon and eggs right now. I mean for supper. Darn if I know. It's up to you. I don't care what you have. Oh, yes, you do. If it's something you don't like, you'll have plenty to say tonight. Gee whiz, Clara, why do you bother me about what that have for supper? I got enough to do to look after my own business. A fellow certainly ought to be able to depend on his wife to run the house. But I try to run it to please you, dear. Well, all I say is go easy. Say, breakfast is no time to ask me what I want for supper. Gee whiz, I'm all full of bacon and eggs now. What I'm going to want tonight, I can't imagine. Well, how do you expect me to imagine it? Say, you women give me... Doggone it. You ask me this question every morning of my life. Looks to me like you get a little system in your work. System? <laughs> Do you realize how much time I spend every morning planning meals and figuring out what to give you for supper? You know, you're not the easiest man in the world to please. No? Well, you know what I'd do if I were running this house? No, I should like to have you tell me. Instead of having this eternal question come up every morning of what do you want for supper, I'd sit down and plan menus for three meals a day for 30 days ahead. No, I'd make it for 60 days. And as regularly as those days rolled around, we'd have plenty of variation and good food to eat and I wouldn't have to be bothered every morning trying to think what to purchase for supper. That's what we do in business. I told you that before. Don't see why the same thing won't work in the home. Well, if you think it's so easy, why don't you stay home and try it someday? Hmm. Junior, fold up your napkin. Oh, gee. Mother, can I have a piece of candy? No. Any little girl that won't eat the crust on her toast can't have any candy. I will eat it, Mother. Then can I go out to play? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> well, goodbye, dear. I'll be seeing you tonight. Goodbye, dear. Good morning, Mrs. Homemaker. This is Eloise Arvilla speaking from station KFF in Cincinnati, transmitting with daily frequency from the laboratories of the Kroger Food Foundation, 125 Government Square. This morning, we bring you the amazing story in sound and pictures of the new institution established by the Kroger Grocery and Baking Company to help you in the vitally important work of selecting your family food so that you can get the full measure of value in each article that you buy and of preparing it so as to preserve both its nutritive value and its tastiness. The Kroger Food Foundation is set up, as you will see, with the most complete facilities and staff of experts for the carrying on of this important work of any similar institution in the country. You will see well-equipped laboratories and competent workers for the making of practically every known chemical, physical, bacteriological, and biological test. Here, for example, is a stack of canned peaches, a typical scene in one of the laboratories of the Kroger Food Foundation. These peaches are going to be analyzed and tested for quality, quantity, and everything else. How would you, Mrs. Homemaker, go about finding out which one of these cans contained the best peaches or gave the most for your money? In a store, you would probably shake them or try to gauge their heft. You would look in vain for some information on the labels that you could depend upon. And you might, in a desperate effort, try to smell them. The grocer would certainly not cut the can open for you to taste them, the best possible guide that you, unaided, could have as to their quality. Well, how does the scientist in the Kroger Food Foundation test canned peaches for Kroger stores? First, 
he weighs each can for gross weight. Uninfluenced by labels or brand names, these scientists work with numbered cans. Next, he opens the can and determines the total weight of the contents, then allows it to drain for two minutes on a half-inch mesh screen. He weighs the fruit residue and checks the solid contents to ensure that the declared net weight is correct. He tests the syrup for its sugar content on this curious little instrument known as the BRICS scale. He then takes the separate pieces of fruit and examines their color and odor, since a good flavor and a good odor generally go together. Then he judges their uniformity and the amount of skin, if any, left on the peeled pieces, the ruggedness of the pieces, and finally, he puts each piece through a test that gives a mathematical rating of its tenderness by means of applying given weights to a rod as it pierces the fruit. Here we see a similar crushing test being applied to a can pea. When you consider that only a few ounces of pressure are needed to crush a can pea, whereas the human jaw is capable of exerting as much as 150 pounds of pressure at a bite, you get some idea as to the greater sensitiveness of this machine over human teeth, tongue, and palate in testing tenderness. What is this young lady doing with that toy in her hand? This is no toy. This is a colorimeter, and she is gauging, not guessing, at the color of these tomatoes. Color in tomatoes is an important element of quality because their taste seems to vary with it. With this little spinning color wheel, she can match the color of the can's contents exactly and get a mathematical reading of the result. Speaking of taste, scientific instruments have not yet has been invented that can give a reading on either taste or odor. To test these qualities, human senses must still be employed. Laboratory workers, however, do not rely upon their own judgment alone. It is not uncommon to ask groups visiting the foundation to state their preferences as to taste among several different samples of foods. In this same way, every other phase of the foundation work is stamped with a seal of practicality by the cooperation of the Homemakers Reference Committee, an organization of women from almost every city in the Middle West, who are the proving ground for all the ideas, recipes, and methods developed in the foundation laboratories and kitchens. They put the final stamp of practical approval on the activities of this modern organization. Down the hall from the chemical laboratory, equally interesting tests are being performed on cereals. No, no, these are not cottons of ice cream. They contain samples of flour, the kind from which the staff of life is made. The laboratory scientist is interested in the chemical makeup of the contents so he can tell whether it will make Kroger quality bread. He puts them through a whole series of tests, but the most interesting of all is how he determines the protein content of the flour. It has to be digested, and this is the stomach he uses for that purpose. How would you like to have a tummy like this, consisting of a lot of glass flasks heated electrically to break down the proteins? Note how the noxious gases are carried out of the room. Over on the other side of the machine, the chemical processes on the digested flour are completed and an exact index of the protein content of each specimen is obtained. Do you weigh the ingredients for your flour when you are baking bread in your own kitchen? The Kroger laboratory scientist does. He weighs the flour, water, yeast, salt, and sugar for every loaf to the last five hundredths of a gram. He cuts the dough in this clever little mixing machine, running it exactly 45 seconds at low speed and 30 seconds at second speed, after which he kneads it 10 times in his hands. A lot of trouble? Oh, yes. But there must be no guesswork in this baking. What is he baking? Rolls? No, no. These are loaves of bread, small ones to be sure. So small, in fact, that he calls them pup loaves. They are big enough for his test purposes, however, and he bakes them in this little oven which permits constant control over them. Does this look like monkey business? Well, Let's take a look into something that you will surely admit is not monkey business 
over in one of the Kroger bakeries, where thousands of loaves of bread are baked daily, and where failure with a single batch would mean hundreds of loaves ruined. Hence, the baker must be a scientist. Every 15 minutes, this huge mixer, and others like it, gets its carefully measured quota of dough and whacks it around until it is exactly right. It is then left four and one half hours to sponge or raise, and then it is mixed with milk, sugar, salt, shortening, and malt in exact quantities determined by the laboratory in a room maintained at a constant 80 degree temperature. After being mixed, it is allowed to set for 45 minutes in these huge pans, where it will again rise, after which it is dumped down into machines that cut the dough up into chunks of equal weight, which are placed in pans. An inspector checks the uniformity of the machine's work by frequently weighing random cuts. Before they reach the oven, however, they stand for an hour and a half in this control room, maintained at a constant 98 degree temperature. Then they go into the oven, regimented into beautiful white rows on a continuous moving belt. Partway down the oven, you can open up a window and see how the once dull white loaves have now changed to a beautiful yellow, in delightful contrast to the streaks of blue flame from the gas jets above. Still further down the oven, open up another window, and the loaves are now a golden brown. And here, just seven minutes further on, they already look good enough to eat. Indeed, they are tantalizingly fragrant when they come out of the oven at the other end after 30 minutes in its constant temperature. It isn't necessary to poke a straw to these loaves to know that they are done, or to taste them to know that they are delicious. If this were not a talkie, but as smelly, your nose would tell you how good this bread is. Another moving belt conveyor takes the warm loaves for a ride back and forth across the big room for a whole hour until they are cool. Then they are wrapped at the rate of 50 loaves a minute, and very soon they will be fresh bread on somebody's table. But wait, let's hustle back to the Kroger Food Foundation and especially into the bacteriological laboratory. For here, you will see an example of how the foundation work protects the customer in still another way. These workers are studying the preservation of meats in the store. The chief concern of every good food merchant is to deliver his foods in such a condition that they will keep for a long time in the kitchen, pantry, or icebox. Store display cases are, therefore, vitally important, as these tests prove. Under the microscopes in the bacteriological laboratory, bacterial growth was studied in various kinds of meat, not only for the types of bacteria allowed to grow, but also their number or rate of growth. The results of these studies are charted for reference use by foundation scientists. What dark deeds are going on here? In this room, the Kroger Food Foundation has a means of seeing the invisible and of recording it for permanent reference. Here, microphotographs are made of bacteria, molds, and yeast to reveal their character and rate of growth. Structures are photographed under the microscope in connection with the studies of growth, nutrition, and other factors. The microphotograph also reveals the kind and extent of adulterants in some kinds of foods when these are difficult to detect otherwise. Oh. Excuse us. Looks as though we are intruding into somebody's living room. Well, there are others coming here too. What is this place and who are these women? Why, this is the assembly room of the Kroger Food Foundation. We have invited you here today to witness a food demonstration, to judge menus, and to participate in a discussion of food and its preparation. Well, that sounds interesting. Let's just turn around and see what they are looking at. The foundation kitchen. This kitchen experiments with the proper cooking of foods so as to preserve both their nutritive value and their taste and attractiveness. Upon days when no demonstration is scheduled, recipes and cooking processes are tested under exactly the same conditions as the average housewife finds in her own home. 
These trained home economists work out menus for different occupational, age, and seasonal needs. They figure out the food requirements and possibilities for all sizes of family food budgets. An important part of their observations consists of noting the number of servings that a given purchase of food will provide and of planning subsequent meals for making use of leftovers. For example, this group of women that we see gathered here is from a church club which has assembled for hearing a discussion and demonstration of how the feeding problems of church social affairs can be handled. Each woman is supplied with a pamphlet giving her information on how to determine quantities, the average amount in a serving, how many people one chicken will serve, how much bread is needed per head, how much soup, and so on, together with suggestions for performing the work and proposed menus with recipes and market lists which tell how much food to buy. Now, the conclusions and findings of the Kroger Food Foundation, in all its ramifications, are published in bulletins that are issued in quantities of one million at a time and distributed through the Kroger stores and the Foundation's own Bureau of Information, which brings us back again to the Cincinnati headquarters. What an interesting place this Bureau of Information is. Here, every mail brings a stack of letters from women all over the country asking for help in the working out of their food problems. When may I substitute brown sugar for white? Why is cream of tartar used in making angel food cake? Please give me a recipe for cheesecake. What will prevent red cabbage from turning purple during cooking? My husband's salary has been cut. How can I feed a family of four on my new food budget? Won't you please help me plan my meals? These and literally thousands of other questions like them are received by the Bureau of Information and answered with the full courtesy, accuracy, and authenticity of this unusual institution. Thus, the personal assistance of the Foundation staff goes daily into scores of American homes. And so ends the interesting story of the scientific work that the Kroger Food Foundation is doing. Won't you, Mrs. Homemaker, avail yourself of its counsel and resources? Yes, I will. You have the answer to my problem. Who are you talking to, Mother? Hasn't Daddy gone yet? Yes. I guess I was just talking to myself. Mother, all the kids have gone to school and have anyone to play with. Can I go over to Kroger this morning? You certainly may, but you help Mother pick up the breakfast dishes so she can hurry up. I want to get back and write a letter to the Foundation. What's a Foundation, Mother? Well, this will be a Foundation of an easier time for Mother if it helps her run her house better. I won't have to spoil Daddy's breakfast by asking him what he wants for supper. Won't he be surprised? Oh, goody! I like surprises. And will the Foundation let us have ice cream for supper every night? Know about that? <laughs>